world is changing fast. New technologies are impacting how we think about products, services, and the way we live our lives. Nowhere is this trend more present than in financial services, where new business models and customer expectations are changing our conceptions about banking, finance, and the very nature of money. Welcome to Rebank, a visionary podcast about banking, fintech, and the future. The future of banking is here. I'm thrilled to be joined by Chris Gledhill today. Chris regularly ranks number one globally in terms of fintech influencers and often speaks and writes about fintech, banking, and the future of financial services. Chris was lead mobile architect and led the disruptive innovation labs at Lloyd's Banking Group before founding Seco, a next generation bank. Chris's expertise spans a wide range of disruptive technologies, including blockchain, AI, APIs, big data, deep learning, virtual reality, cryptocurrencies, biometrics, mobile, and wearables. Chris is a regular blogger, and his Twitter feed, at C. Gledhill, has become a must-follow for anyone in the industry looking to keep up to date with the latest fintech developments around the world. Chris, welcome to Rebank. Hey, how's it going? So I, I briefly out- outlined your background in the intro. Tell us a bit more about how you got into technology and banking innovation in the first place. Yeah, so it sounds like quite a geeky overview when you do it like that. I guess I've, I've kind of been quite lucky in that my career has spanned both tech roles and business roles. Uh, so I've had quite a colorful career, not necessarily entirely in financial services. So I've done quite a lot in um, utilities, oil and gas industry. I've done quite a lot in government public services uh, and retail um, space. So I've had a, a good view across industry. Also, I've had a selection of roles which started off being very technical so being a, a developer a coder uh, but then moving into more strategy roles and ultimately innovation roles which is how i started getting into into the fintech space looking a bit more forward into the future uh, but yeah ultimately i guess i'm a geek at heart so it's technology first and kind of banking second yeah i guess if in the fintech in the balance of fin and tech i guess i'm more in the tech side than the fin side uh just because i see because tech is by nature it's a is a horizontal that goes across industries um whereas financial services is a changing thing so yeah i yeah i tend to be more tech than fin so you used to be involved in innovation at lloyd's before leaving to found seco what motivated that move for you so at Lloyd's, I had quite a cool role. So I was the lead of their X Labs, which is something I created in Lloyd's. It was a more of a disruptive innovation labs. Um, I left Lloyd's just because it's a perfect timing in London to be launching a new type of bank. There's obviously there's a lot of challenge banks popping up all over the place, like Atoms and Starlings and Monzo and Tandems and all that kind of stuff. But I saw quite a big opportunity for somebody to start a truly different type of banking experience. Uh, and that was not something I was obviously able to do within a large incumbent organization. It's, it's difficult to, to that, do that nature of work and realized that it was just perfect timing from a from an industry point of view, from London's position as ground zero of fintech awesomeness, uh, from a regulatory point of view, and also from a societal point of view, there were bigger problems outside of banking and inside of banking that just needed to be solved. Uh, and all that came together, just perfect time. I realized that uh, it was kind of now or never to go ahead and do this second project. Okay, so I guess that leads us nicely into to Seco. So describe Seco for the uninitiated. Uh, so it's, it's, it takes a while to describe Seco. We're, we're calling it a socioeconomic community. So it's, a, it's kind of a cross between a social network and a trading platform. Uh, and platform is probably the, the key term here. It is a platform, not, a, not necessarily a, a single product. Uh, what we're creating in Seco is a ability for people to create their own money. Uh, and this is quite an important piece. This is the fundamental difference between Seco and any of the other financial services out there at the moment. Uh, a lot of the fintech space, albeit doing some awesome stuff, are still optimizing our existing understanding of banking and money. With Seco, we want to break away from that and conceptually shift what money is, because money is just a blunt tool, really. Uh, and shuffling it about is is kind of cool, but really um, it is inflexible and it doesn't adequately uh, evaluate your true worth so right now, you're worth to a bank. You go in there and it's like, how much money have you got? How much is your house worth? If you've got any other investments, they total up in the spreadsheet and say, that's how much you're worth as a person. Uh, we think that's wrong. So in Seco, we've got this vision. And our vision is that we want to create a world where your wealth is the contents of your character, not the contents of your wallet. 
So what that means is instead of a bank balance in Seco, you have a reputational score. Instead of dealing with state-backed fiat currencies, you can deal with uh, fiat, corporate currencies, and most importantly, personal currencies that you can create. Uh, your reputation becomes that um, that unit of wealth that you build and curate, uh, and your data becomes a commodity. So you can lend, spend, invest your data just as you can your money. Uh, all of that uh, we've wrapped into a very engaging social network sort of platform that looks a lot like Pokemon Go from its user interface uh, and behaves like a um, Internet of People sort of platform. So the idea is it's uh, everybody's broadcasting a personal interface uh, and they can trade with people in their proximity. And it's uh, from our initial alpha trials, it's extremely engaging. People seem to love the platform. Well, I think we can hopefully break that down piece by piece only because there's a lot there. And um, I've been really looking forward to this conversation because I love what you're doing and um, look forward to, to understanding it in even deeper detail. So it sounds like effectively there's a kind of money and banking piece, a data management slash reputation management piece, and a social network piece. Do you view all three as being equally important or is the philosophical premise kind of geared around one primary so what we're doing we've fundamentally creating a new platform and if somebody already had an existing um play in that space that we could feed off someone's api or their platform then we would do that but these uh these parts of our proposition are important they have to go together there's a whole graveyard of startups that we've been researching who have done things like trying to monetize people's data. They've said, why don't you connect your LinkedIn, your Facebook, and your Twitter to our platform, and we'll pay you $25 a month for all your data, right? Uh, and that's failed universally. People hate that because it's a little bit weird and a little bit spooky, and they don't want that level of interactions, whereas people will happily connect to Candy Crush or um, Angry Birds and give the same amount of data uh, in exchange for playing the game because they want that experience, right? We've realized that for people to um, start understanding the value of the data, we need to hold their hand and take them on that journey. And for that, we need a social network. It has to be fun and engaging, otherwise people won't do it. There's no point in having some really smart blockchain platform for here. If nobody wants to use it, nobody gets it. It has to be something that solves some real problems and is fun in the process of doing that as well. Uh, so we totally need that social network piece. Um, in terms of the um, monetizing of their data, that is not something that you can do a big bang approach to. People understand that data has value uh, and they get worried about data theft and identity theft and that worries people but linking it together uh, and being able to educate people will take some time uh, i think we've been very naive for like the last 10 or 15 years we've just like given away all our data and splurged around the internet uh, and reclaiming that information takes time um, and you need a social network that makes that fun and engaging as well um, so yeah they, they are essential parts of this proposition so from a kind of a, a practical user perspective, what would what would a user of, of Setco, once you guys are kind of fully operational, um, expect? How, how would that how that experience look? Is it connecting sources of existing sources of data? Is it do you fund an account at any point? Uh, how, how does how does that work practically? Yeah, so practically you get uh, it manifests itself as an app. And the app has a storage space, like a cold store wallet, I guess, if you in the in the crypto space. In there, you can deposit um, value tokens, and those value tokens could be your personal data or uh, fiat, corporate, or personal currencies that you put in this in this space. And there's an automatic kind of or an automated conversion between external data and and tokens within the the wallet. So we're trying to avoid um, the idea of. Um, from like exchange of values of these tokens we don't want people to create a data token but in their head think about what it's worth in in dollar value we want people to start decoupling themselves from understanding wealth as in monetary wealth start thinking about the reputational value of of these items that they have in their wallet mm -hmm. uh, so it's a little bit of a weird conceptual shift it's not really a problem but we found that um, younger generations seem to get this a lot better than older generations. Older generations, like you go on holiday and you buy a beer in some foreign currency and in your head you're doing a little sum about what's this worth for my home currency and you go, oh, that's an expensive beer, right? After you've been there for a few weeks or whatever, then you start thinking in native currency and you get general relative value of what that's worth um, without having to do the equation. We want to have people on the platform be able to just launch straight in with their own um, defining these wealth tokens without having to peg it back to the 20th century model which they used to and so how, how would a, a transaction on the model work 
Um, so it depends on the scenario, right? So maybe let's do a do an example, like say a fashion example. So you could have a fashionista on this platform, somebody who's really into their fashion, their image, they're very image conscious, some young standard um, textbook millennial, right? Uh, they can um, create their own personal interface, a digital aura that they broadcast on our platform. So this is the idea that they could physically dress themselves with their clothes and their fashion, and then they've got all their other social cues. They've got like their wristbands and their t-shirts and their and their, all the other kind of accessories they put on them. Then they digitally dress themselves. So they decide what to broadcast that day. So they could say, rate my outfit or follow me on this or um, come to my party or whatever. They broadcast a certain interface wherever they go to that proximity. Uh, and they could be walking around London and Oxford Street or Carnaby Street or whatever. Somebody could come along and see them and um, say, well, I really love her shoes or her handbag's amazing or I hate her dress or something like that, right? And they could um, give them a medal. So they could create a, a value token, call it a medal, call it um, you know, outfit of the day and give that to the person, like a, a virtual post-it note. You can stick that on the person. Um, but then what you find is they could say, well, I love your shoes. Here's a medal for that. If I actually, these shoes are from Zara. It's 20% off. Here's a coupon for 20% off. So that person could send it back to the other person. That person goes and buys the shoes from Zara, right? Um, what happens in that in that transaction is that the person who bought the shoes gets twenty percent off. The person who's who's wearing the shoes earns a referral bonus if somebody's bought it from them, uh, and Zara gets a whole new retail sale. Uh, those uh, coupons, referral tokens, medals, all of those are currency in our platform. They're created individually or from a corporate. It's backed by a reputation of the issuer, and it has value and it's transitive and can be traded in that space. Um, so the advantage there is that you have a, a social discovery platform for for people. You have a new um, social network, a new broadcast interface for the, the people on the platform. Um, the retailer gets a new sales channel. So not just selling digitally or physically in their stores. Every one of the customers is goes beyond being a brand advocate. They become a, a walking sales channel, like a walking mannequin uh, for their brand. Um, and it's totally engaging and quite a fun experience. And there's no kind of um, hard sell or anything in there. It is literally a an extension of what kids already doing so kids already today will go onto instagram every day they'll take a selfie they'll post their outfit they might take it on lookbook and they'll get people to view it we're giving a um a real world version of that um those um actions that they're already doing in a in a digital sense so the the, the platform users would identify each other when you talked about the fashionista broadcasting her presence that would be done to other users of the app who would then be able to see it via the app interface yeah and this is why fashion is such a good place to start with this because people don't consider clothes to be purely utility it's not just about keeping warm it's about looking good and stylish and actually beyond there it's about showing off facets about yourself so what causes you're passionate about what um, charities you're into what brands you associate with what bands you like to follow there's so much more to fashion than just the utility of it um and being able to extend that broadcast beyond the the physical cues, the accessories that we, we hang off ourselves, like a wristband saying went to Glastonbury or a t-shirt saying I like this band or whatever. Being able to digitally broadcast beyond that, so saying that my outfit was designed by this designer and here's the store. My um, my outfit is certified not using any child labor or with renewable sources or zero carbon or whatever is important to that person. They say, here's all the charities I support. You can donate to my causes. Here's all the, um, here's the universities and clubs and societies, all the other things I'm part of. Suddenly you're broadcasting so much more than it would be practically you able to um, just hang off yourself, right? So in the example that you gave uh about the, the the shoes from zara it sounds like the interaction that begins on the platform and the exchange of digital tokens digital value that happens on the platform eventually gets taken offline as the purchaser of the shoes goes to zara and presumably pays with their existing bank account is there a point in time when when that all shifts onto the seco platform is that part of the vision so it depends on what these currency coupons are for so in that scenario that was a corporate coin that we call it on our platform so it would be issued by a um a retailer who could create these coup these coins like they would coupons and vouchers today uh, and just like today they get exchanged as a discount or some voucher or some freebie or whatever down the line in a more conventional sense if you've got um things like you could have a brand who creates a sticker or a badge so it could be a very high-end fashion brand could say here is a badge which you could put on your aura to broadcast that you are um, 
a fan of this brand or associate with it. So that's not something that's necessarily redeemable. It's literally just a badge. It's like a digital equivalent to somebody having a, a Ferrari keyring, saying my other car's a Ferrari or something like that, right? It's a um, it is a brand association where you could have um, individual currencies. So it could be that this fashion person gets a lot of these referrals. They build their uh, reputation as a, a fashion expert. They could broadcast an interface saying, um, I will be your personal shopper or I'll give you some fashion advice. So here's a token for a piece of fashion advice, uh, which they could broadcast on the door and say, I, I issue, I do fashion advice services. Here's a token, please take one or please um, purchase one. And that purchase doesn't necessarily have to be in, in today's currency, it could be in something else that they want. So they could say, I give fashion advice and I need um, X, Y, Z. And if somebody's got that need, they can actually do a bartering exchange mm -hmm. or they could actually say, I'll give away free of fashion advice because that help boost my reputation in the field of fashion. So ultimately you end up with this reputational currency where people do things to boost their reputation, not necessarily to, to garner more fiat currency to exchange in a more conventional system. At what stage of the development process are you guys currently? Uh, so we call ourselves at alpha stage right now. So we, uh, we've built the prototype of the platform, an alpha version, which we've been trying out with real people, mostly in the kind of these young fashion millennials that I've been talking about. Uh, so we've kind of proved the tech, proved that this is possible, proved that there is a massive appetite in our target demographic for what we're doing. Uh, and we're now just, um, looking at our beta stage now so we're starting to develop a beta version of it and looking for uh, our next stage of investment to to real, really scale this thing up how many people are involved at this point on the seco side uh so we've got about 10 people now on the on the team so me and the co-founder and then and the rest of the team so yeah we're, we're a passionate team and growing can you tell us a little bit about the technology behind the platform yeah, so we've talked about the user interface a bit. So the user interface is a Pokemon Go style geolocation services interface, right? So, right. so it's both kind of the map functionality and the see the world through the camera lens? Um, so that, so the, right now it's got the mapping functionality. Um, the augmented reality piece um, is not something we're building right now in the alpha. So the idea that you could hold up your phone and scan the area, I think that works really well for things like Pokemon Go for virtual things. When you start talking about real people, I think there's still too much social stigma attached to being able to hold up your phone and wave it in front of somebody and see somebody through a, uh, an augmented lens. I think that's still a little bit weird and spooky. Uh, I think that will happen when we start getting um, pervasive augmented reality devices that are the size of normal spectacles. I think that's when that might become the norm. But right now I don't think uh, we're ready as a society for that level of creepiness. Um, but definitely the, the mapping piece, the GPS geolocation services piece, uh, that is the uh, fundamental piece of the interface. Uh, in terms of on your phone, your phone becomes the master of your data. So that's the um, uh, the cold store wallet, if you want to call it that, where you can master your, your coins and your data into that wallet. Um, the broadcast piece, um, right now it's through that GPS, looking at the Bluetooth also as a, a secondary option to that. Um, the tracking of the coins, this is uh, right now it's done on a, um, a colored coins impl implementation uh, and we're developing out what we're calling Blocktree, which is our, uh, I guess, proprietary version of uh, blockchain technology, which allows us to do both online and offline um, digital currency transactions mm -hmm. uh, because we believe that's quite important. I.e. if the transaction happens when there's no internet connection, it updates at a future date? Yes, yeah, so there's, yeah, so there's two parts to that. So yeah, it allows you to do offline transactions where you've got no internet connectivity. So you could be in a developing world country or in the middle of nowhere or at a festival or somewhere else where you don't have internet connectivity. It, it solves that problem where you, you don't have to be online to, to make that happen, but also solves some privacy issues as well. So you could be in a in a developed country of internet connectivity, we don't necessarily want that transaction to be tracked. There's quite good reasons why we still use cash in some in some places. Uh, so for example, if you're in a living under a dictatorship and you want to buy a book that's critical of the regime, right now you'd buy that in cash because you don't want that traced back to you, right? In a digital world, when we're using Apple Pay and Android Pay, that becomes a real problem. So you end up with civil liberty issues. You don't get freedom of speech suppression. You end up with freedom of commerce suppression. Uh, so you do need a, a anonymous way of transacting in a digital space. So we're kind of solving that problem as well. So you mentioned the kind of the secure access to, to, to the data, personal data vault effectively. Is, and is that on kind of a you know, public key, private key model similar to what a Bitcoin wallet might, might use? Um, 
So your personal data vault is on your phone and you get to control complete privacy on that. So as Seco, there is no big backend database or no massive big shared ledger where all the data is flying around everywhere. It's literally you get to master it yourself. It's like people who are suspicious of the banking system just get all their money in cash and stick it under the mattress and that's banking for them, right? You could potentially do the same thing with your data now. You can shovel your data under a digital mattress and just keep it totally secure. Uh, what we're doing is allowing people to then open up their own personal APIs, we call them IPIs, or individual personal interfaces, uh, up to the level that their risk appetite or privacy concerns will allow them to to do. Uh, and we believe that's an important part of what we're building. That's where you kind of create this thing called reverse cloud, where we're no longer outsourcing all the storage of our data to lots of auxiliary services in banking, government, and utilities, and education, all these kind of things. You start mastering your personal data, becoming your own personal CRM engine, uh, and sharing information as you deem fit. And not just sharing like giving, but it could be investing or lending or spending data on top of that. In terms of the kind of initial contribution of, of data into your personal wallet, how, how does that happen? Um, so what we want to do is allow people to start building up profiles. Um, so there's a a challenge for a lot of social networks where new social networks come along and they say, join our social network, please populate your profile. And then it's like a massive hassle to go through and fill out where you went to school and where you work. And nobody wants to do all that because it's a big drag, right? You also have this problem where you can say, well, let, let's import all that stuff from an existing network. But then you don't have the validation of how, how true to form is this kind of stuff. So what we want people to do is to start um, creating a profile and being very selective about what they actually choose to put on there. And we, we want to be... Uh, deliberately limiting so that people have to make a conscious decision so on our alpha platform you get to broadcast on your aura six items of data six interfaces i suppose six apis um, so six offerings in your shop fund so it's like everyone gets a personal shop fund they're only allowed to sell six things and it could be here's an hour of my time or a piece of my knowledge or uh, fund my charity or do whatever we want people to to be selective about that and then after a while um you build up that reputation on the items that you've you've chosen to 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 push uh rather than people just putting in lots of unvalidated data we'd rather you gain a reputation for something and that is the data item rather than populating it so it's like in facebook i say i'm good at golf right i just put my facebook profile but in second it would be more uh, I members of golf clubs, I visit golf courses, I connect with people who play golf, I buy golfing items. That reputation is much more valuable uh, than just saying I like golf. And I guess one of the, the beauties of, of the platform is that it's kind of infinitely scalable across geographies. Yeah, so we're not necessarily limited by geographies right now. We're, we're UK based and from a logistical point of view, that's where we live, literally live. Uh, but we're not limited in terms of regulatory boundaries for where this can be rolled out right now. Um, so yeah, this is a, um, a highly scalable platform. We've designed it as such with uh, with our experience in, in in architecture. We don't want this to be um, necessarily constrained by any of the, the usual um, uh, usual blockers. What is the feedback from your initial alpha users been so far? So it's been pretty awesome actually. So in our target customer base, these kind of young millennial, fashion conscious, image conscious types they get it they really get it this really chimes with them this is a missing social network in their landscape uh, they really suffer right now from the gap between their digital digital social networking and their physical social networking there is nothing which glues the two together um and this it this really appeals to to that crowd the idea of being able to monetize your reputation appeals to that crowd as well because they're naturally uh, not particularly wealthy in, in traditional means, but they are very wealthy in brand and image and knowledge and excitement and, and all this kind of stuff is is quite important to them. And this is what their these values they realize in their social communities, but it's not something that's traditionally picked up by brands and corporates. Uh, so being able to give them ability to realize their, their holistic wealth works really well for them as well. Then having this ability to create these value tokens and exchange and trade these tokens um, appeals very well to that group because they're already kind of doing it just in a roundabout way. So you look at what they're doing on things like Snapchat, that kind of stuff. They're not just Snapchatting with each other. They're exchanging value tokens. And these could be memes or these could be Pokemons or these could be jokes or whatever. These are tokens that they are exchanging with other people. You tell someone a joke and they'll tell you a joke back. This kind of basic stuff. It's like uh, playground trading cards, but in a digital sense, they already trade in multitudes of currencies. Plus they already manage um, 
reputational currency very well in in and it takes forms like celebrity so the ad, average kind of 14 15 year old will manage about 200 celebrities in their head so they know which celebrities are on the way up which ones are cool right now and which ones are kind of on the way down they manage that like a stock broker would manage a portfolio of companies right they're very astute at doing that uh, and your job as a teenager is to associate yourself with brands and celebrities that are really cool which makes you look very cool so you're trying to build a reputation through association with these brands uh, and then when the celebrity is on the way down then generally you try to drop them and find a new one right so translate that into currency so instead of celebrities they have 200 currencies that they manage these currencies are issued by celebrities or by brands or by charities or whatever they're passionate about and using these currencies builds your personal reputation so it's not a job to collect all of the currency and become particularly rich in a particular one the job is to use these in a transitionary state to boost your personal reputation uh, as these things are are cool and this is that thing that's very difficult for um generations who have lived and breathed 20th century banking for a long time to get but for the younger audience they totally get this and it's quite exciting uh, the sort of feedback we're getting we've got lots of good videos coming out quite soon about um the feedback we're getting on on this kind of stuff so thinking kind of add into the future once uh Maseko's up and running and, and you've kind of um you established the vision to your early objectives how would say larger scale transactions work or could they for instance someone needs to buy a car someone needs to go to go to university how would that work yeah so Seco is inherently a gig economy or sharing economy compatible platform so it's kind of future ready in that sense uh we're imagining that your need to make large life stage value purchases like a, a car or a house will be diminishing um as our platform scales up so uh, i don't believe we'll necessarily be buying cars for much longer i'd imagine a lot of driverless cars and uber type models will remove the need for for that right um, the same thing for houses i think the mortgage model of buying a house is not necessarily the right way to go about it because the mortgage isn't the product that you buy you're trying to get a home so you want to get a home right so you don't need a, a mortgage anymore than you need a, a cd to get music uh, so i think we'll we'll evolve more into a uh, call it renting if you like for for properties but probably not in the style of renting that we understand it today but it won't be a a an ownership like you have to make a a large life stage purchase so i don't think we have to think too much about those purchases right now because i don't believe they'll be that important in the future in terms of that, i guess the one of those three pillars which was the social networking one is it is it social networking in the sense that people in the real world can connect with each other through a digital platform or is it is it actually a platform on which people can meet like-minded individuals affinity groups can come together people can can interact and, and, and meet people in new ways. Yes, it's kind of a bit of both. So right now, social networks are, they have a membership model. So you sign up, you create a profile, you connect with other people, they become a, a, a connection, and then you join groups, and now you're assigned to that group. So it's a very kind of membership model. Whereas in the real world, it's quite a transitionary thing where you could be chatting with somebody on the bus and that connection lasts for the duration of your bus journey or somebody asks for um, the time or to light your cigarette or you donate some money to a homeless person these are connections that are more um, transactional interactional uh, and quite temporal in their nature uh, so we'd like to build a lot more of those and i think this would overcome a real problem and digital loneliness that we have right now so like in london there's like seven million people all going about their day-to-day -day lives all sat there staring at their phone ignoring everybody around them and we don't really talk to people um because they were british and we don't like to like to talk to strangers but actually the reason why you don't talk to random people in london is first a you don't know if they're if they're crazy b you don't know if there's some value there so you don't know if there's um something that they have that's going to be interesting or useful to you uh and thirdly you don't know if um if they're open to a conversation or exchange right now whereas if you have a platform like seco that broadcasts a i'm not crazy because here's my reputation score b there is some value exchange because here is the here is my values and here are products and services i've got to offer and c yes i am available because i have a status of available i've got a status of talk to the hand you know depending on what uh what you configure it to be so suddenly you have a, like a total social lubricant that opens up all of these interactions so you could just be sitting on the bus and somebody over there is broadcasting um 
I've just finished this book. Can someone recommend a new author for me? Somebody else is saying, I'm stuck on crossword nine down. Someone else is over there saying, I'm launching a startup. Can somebody invest in me? And somebody else is over there. You know, so suddenly everybody is um, has call to actions, um, but not call to actions, call to interactions that everybody broadcasts. So suddenly it does open up a whole new a whole new way of interacting. And then it cuts down on so much like prejudice that we have today. Because right now, we're because we don't have this additional metadata, we're judging everyone on their physical appearance. It's like we're literally judging books by its covers. Everybody, we say, oh, look at them, you know, based on what they're wearing and how they're, how they're acting. This is, we're making judgments on people. Whereas actually, if you could start broadcasting additional metadata about yourself, we might start cutting through a lot of this prejudice, a lot of this kind of upfront physical prejudice that we that we see in society. Uh, so like a homeless person right now, you might see a homeless person, you make some judgment call based on what they look like. But if they could broadcast their history or their story, uh, then you might be more inclined or a bit more empathetic of a particular situation. Um, it's like having your, you know, your walking profile, like a LinkedIn profile, or, uh, a CV or some other way where you can configure uh, a broadcast just means that I think we will stop immediately judging people with withhold judgment until we've thoroughly consumed their aura before we make that judgment just as we do in a in an online sense so if somebody sends you an invite through some social network and you don't know who this person is you go on their profile you skim it for like 20 seconds and you make a judgment based on what you're seeing on that profile um rather than just looking at the picture right we want people to start doing that in the in the physical world what's the monetization model for for seco how does seco make money um, so we've created this thing called a reverse marketplace. So if you think about marketplaces for the last three, four, five thousand years, since the dawn of human civilization, marketplaces have been places where people with products and services to sell meet in one place and customers come there to buy that stuff, right? We've reversed that. We've created a marketplace where customers go to um, broadcast their, their needs, their wants, their hopes, their dreams, their aspirations. They are broadcasting that they are selling their problems in the marketplace. Uh, and then companies with products and services can go and buy those problems or buy those needs or buy the, the, uh, the data of these people. Uh, and provide solutions to their problems. So in Seco, unlike a bank where you deposit lots of money and you earn interest on your money, uh, in Seco you earn interest on how interesting you are in this platform. And that is driven heavily by the ad tech industry. So right now, if you are a company selling, um, I don't know, skiing holidays, you will um, pay money to Google AdWords or some other platform where you can try and get your ad banner in front of people who who seem to have some, some liking of skiing. On our platform, you can... Uh, broadcast, I need a winter holiday, skiing, it needs to be family friendly, go and find me something. You broadcast that into the marketplace. Anybody who's selling ski chalets or whatever, they can they can come back to that, they can buy that token of information. Uh, they can go back to that person and they are buying the attention of that person to review their product or service. So it is cutting out the middleman of advertising market, marketing. It's uh, removing the scattergun approach to advertising, which is just blanketing the world with billboards and, and ad banners. And it's doing a direct peer to peer between people with a problem and people with a solution. As the marketplace operators of that, we're like an eBay for solving people's problems. So we take a cut of the um, of the the sales that happen on that uh, that marketplace. So the the actual purchase of the ski vacation would happen off offline by right. traditional banking. So yeah, so if you could potentially, if you're selling a skiing holiday, you could buy the. Um, personas of these people. So, like, say you on this platform, you create a token called uh, send me an email. So, this token is not an email address, it's the ability for somebody to send you an email, right? That token has some value, and that value is proportional to your personal reputation and how much somebody wants to engage in you. So, they're not buying your email address, they're buying your attention for one minute to read an email, right? If you put that token on the platform and say oh and i'm also looking for skiing holiday then people who are selling skiing holidays might buy that email address for one two three four five pounds um, because in terms of cost per acquisition that's probably cheaper than going through the more traditional advertising means and then they um so they could buy access to that customer through our platform and we give the revenue to the customer and take a cut of that then if they want to provide products and services to that customer they could say actually we're going to create our own tokens in this platform so we can create um ski lift tokens could be a currency that they could say actually you know here's here's some free ski lift tokens why don't you get a holiday you know in 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 our skiing resort for example um so it is a um it is a model where we we do encourage um these third parties to basically map their customer ideal customer persona against a marketplace with lots of people and the bigger um seco gets the more people are going to be on this platform the more valuable this data becomes 
Um, we really think this kind of reverse marketplace is going to be, it kind of solves the problem that the ad tech industry has right now, which is that nobody's looking at all the physical billboards and advertising because everyone's staring at their phone. So they said, well, let's put all the adverts on digital sense, but then everyone's got ad blockers now. So nobody's looking at the digital adverts. So they were like, well, crikey, how do we, how do we actually get any of our products and services in front of people? The answer seems, seems obvious. It's in flip it on its head and let's just all broadcast our, our problems or our wants or our dreams or whatever um, and have people who are able to help us. And that could be really basic tangible stuff like short, medium, long-term goals, like short term, I want to find a good Italian restaurant tonight, medium term, I want a skiing holiday this winter, long term, I want to retire comfortably. Or it could be like really unspecified stuff like I need a new hobby or I want to do whatever, or I want to find a new author. That kind of stuff is extremely valuable information for anybody who is um, selling services like that. And it's just not something that we're able to do through the existing advertising channels that we have today. Yeah. And I, and I guess the, the the marketplace element of it kind of makes it work and similar to Google AdWords, for instance. If you're expressing kind of a, a nebulous, high level desire, then uh, then presumably there's less of a kind of monetization opportunity for the business looking to to deliver that for you. So presumably that that token ends up costing less in the marketplace model. It depends what your product you're selling is. So if you consider um, some product lines like perfume, is quite an interesting one because essentially they're selling nice smelling water right but they're they don't market it as that they market it as a aspiration so they say buy our perfume because it will make you wealthy and successful or more attractive or whatever they they sell a lifestyle behind of it so they could actually map onto somebody's lifestyle if somebody is saying i want to be wealthy and successful and attractive they say we'll buy our perfume because it does all three of those kind of things so sometimes there is um value in mapping your product onto intangible goals and having people be able to articulate what these what these things are solves them a lot of problems than trying to drive um who's best um, for their perfume if they could actually look at uh what people really want out of life in the in longer term then they could probably better match some of those lifestyle products to that i guess it makes sense too again in the marketplace model because it filters out potentially some of the the spammier offers i.e if someone is required to pay as in a company's required to pay for your specific token they're not going to do that unless they feel like they have a significant chance of converting on that lead yeah totally it's the problem that we have with email right now if email was um a pay per use thing so if you could uh, if companies had to pay to send you an email then there wouldn't be any spam and actually companies would um the, the more expensive it was to access that email the more um companies would decide whether they really need to send you that email and obviously we all have a certain amount of bandwidth so if you said actually i only read 30 emails a day um then there becomes a bidding process there's supply demand economics and it comes back to a monetary system and companies therefore say look i've got 20 emails which are going to be my business emails and i've got 10 emails which are recreational who wants to bid for one of those 10 emails that i'm going to read today by the way here's a load of stuff that i need so some people who who can um supply those needs would bid quite a lot to um to have on those emails. What are your targets uh, time-wise in terms of launching a beta and, and eventually a more, more fully fleshed out proposition? So we've just this week launched a Series A funding round. So we're looking to raise um, capital to really scale this thing up from our, from our alpha. Uh, that's six weeks, um, so that'll be closing in November. Uh, then we are looking to develop the beta to come out around about March to start deploying that out there and doing some, some, some learning to scale that one up. So we're looking to move quite rapidly now now that we've we've spent a lot of time working on the vision and designing this framework and some of the tech behind of it, we're just now raring to go. We've we believe we've proved the tech, we believe we've proved the customer appetite, and we just want to scale this this thing big now. So, apart from uh, investment capital, what what other resources are you are you looking for? Any anything that uh, that the audience can be can be thinking about? Is it talent? Is it users? Is it what is it? So we are looking uh, to seed the Seco. Um, beta into certain hubs because it's a social network it has a critical mass element and because it's a hyper location element you need a lot of people in a in a proximity for this to be fun because otherwise it's like going into an empty nightclub and nobody's there you think oh this is you know this is a waste of time this is a bit boring so what we're looking at is um having partnerships where we can see this thing in places where there are a lot of target customers so naturally university campuses fashion hubs around london um, enterprise situations we've got lots of people in offices who have talents and services to share we're looking for partners in those kind of spaces where they believe they have some use case for what we're doing um, so anybody who works in those spaces who think who's like listening to this go wow this could really impact my industry x then come and speak to us because it might not be something that we've we thought of 
Um, but as a platform, this is infinitely configurable for any particular industry like that. Um, right now, it's limited by our, our imagination. So we'd like to open that up and get more and more people excited about this and applying this kind of thinking to, to their particular industries. Where can people go to find out more about Seco? Um, so we have our secoaura.com website. It's a good place to go. S-E-C-C-O-A-U-R-A.com. And uh, you can follow me on Twitter as well, at C Gledhill, C-G-O-E-D-H-I-L-L. Uh, and we can chat about it on there. Uh, otherwise, there's quite a lot of links on our website to articles about us. We've got a few other... Um, uh, podcasts and video interviews uh, and blogs that we've written about this uh, there seem to be a TEDx talk coming out on on this particular topic uh, so we've got quite a lot of stuff resources we can go to find out a bit more plus uh, I generally speak at two or three fintech events a week I'm off to like fintech Australia next month and off to Hong Kong later in the year and going to be in um, Davos in January so there's quite a lot I'll be around um, various circuits if you're not kind of London based um, you'll probably catch me in whatever geography you're at um, talking about Seco. Well Chris Gledhill thank you so much for joining us today. Cheers thanks a lot Thanks for tuning in to Rebank If you like today's show, reach out Follow us on Twitter at Rebank Podcast and join the conversation For more on banking fintech and the future check out our regular content at www.bankingthefuture.com 